welcome to the podcast. I'm Thomas Cardona. I'll be hosting at least the first episode of the podcast, which I named Mitch. And I'm with my guest and my dear friend and my boss, Mitchell Primus. All right. So for the first podcast, we're just going to talk about how, how we started here, what, what brought us here, our steps that we took to get here, and then especially what steps Mitch took to get where he is today. So um, tell us where we are right now, Mitch. So uh, right now we are in the uh, second year of a five-year lease with the uh, NJDP. Um, we lease Centerton Golf Club from them. Um, yeah. So when, well. yeah, when you when you say lease Senator Golf Club from the NJDP, most people won't know what you're saying, won't understand that. Mm-hmm. What does it mean to lease a golf course from the NJDP? So, uh, golf courses, the the NJDP owns uh, four golf courses, and uh, we lease one of those four. Um, there's one other golf course in South Jersey that they do own. Uh, it goes out for a bid. Um, every, let's say 10 years, 10, 15 years, um, and operators are able to, uh, put a bid in and then it's not necessarily the highest bidder, uh, as we've seen through the whole process. Um, and they award the bid to the strongest bid, I would say. And when you say we lease it, who is we? So back in 2018, um, we knew that like the, the golf courses go up for bid, um, and you know, well in advance. Uh, so as the head professional at White Oaks, another state owned golf facility, um, I was given the idea, uh, to put together a group, um, one or two investors and, uh, a Lifelong friend, uh, John Bayo, who's also our golf course superintendent. He's one of our partners. Uh, so we put together the group, uh, the Serenos, Chad, Chad and Charlie Serena, and uh, John Bayo. And uh, we had a we have a good good team in place. Um, we cover all facets of the of the industry. Um, a lot of experience. Youth, youth, I think, is the biggest thing in this group. Um, you're young. I'm young, John's young, relatively young. Uh, Charlie's a little bit older, but we need that wisdom there. Yeah. Um, and Chad's also, Quite he's young. in his 20s. So yeah. uh, we're going to be here for a while, and you know, it's kind of exciting to see what the future holds. Um, so you said that John Bayo, lifelong friend, and I know where you guys met, and I know where you and, and Chad met. Um, <laughs> can you talk a little bit about meeting those guys where you are truly from when it comes to the world of golf. So uh, I grew up, uh, my first job was 18 years old at Freeway Golf Course in Sicklerville. Um, Freeway was a, was a great place and a lot of people you run into, they, would, they were either members or they were down a few players at Freeway and they loved playing it. Um, that's where I met John. John worked maintenance. I worked. Uh, I was a cart boy at the time, and uh, that's how we met. Uh, Chad worked there for a couple of years. Um, yeah, it was it was a, it was a good place. Um, it was a good place to see what goes on in the business and <laughs> the right things and a couple wrong things uh, and how I would fix it. So. <clears throat> At 18, pulling carts, I learned uh, how to talk to people, one. Um, I learned I learned the, the ins and outs of the business by just watching. Um, watching people, um, what their habits are, what their spending habits are, um, what they like to do, uh, their lives. Um, and then I used that over the years to uh, 
as like a tool, as a sales tool. Um, if you understand people, um, I think you're you're very you can be very successful in this business. If you understand, get to know the person first. Um, you have to be in touch with your clientele uh, in summary. So I'm, I'm going to start. I'm going to head over to another topic, but as you were talking about all the experience you've learned from being at Freeway, then you went to White Oaks. Now, mm -hmm. obviously, you're here. When and each each step, you gained a bigger and bigger role. But um, with all that experience, right now we talk about COVID. Everybody talks. COVID's on everybody's mind. With COVID. I'm sure you've never had an experience like that. How has the experiences that you've gained from White Oaks and that you've gained from Freeway prepared you to enter the new world of COVID and how it prepared you to overcome losing at least a month of golf season? So <clears throat> it's a good question. Um, I would say uh, I learned – from the golf business, you always have to be one step ahead. So when COVID was kind of first hit the scene in the United States, I guess that was, uh, I mean, it was on news outlets in February that it was happening in China. Um, it was on my radar. Uh, what would happen if it hit the United States? And, you know, you see what was going on in other countries, and then you have to be prepared for um what would happen if it actually affected your life, your day-to-day -day life, your business. Um, so it was on my radar long before it kind of hit the scene in the United States. And I think maybe you could attest to that. I, I was saying it, you know, well in advance. And then when it hit, staying one step ahead, <laughs> you have to properly plan and have things in place. So how I like to run um, this business as far as the management side is always have a bunch of plans, right? So you have your worst case scenario, you have your best case scenario, and then you have something in between. So you have, if you put together three plans, right? And then you brainstorm how these plans are actually gonna work, then you can figure out, okay, maybe I won't do this in, in, in this plan. Maybe I'll take this plan and then mold it and then you have a um, you have a pretty solid plan when it boils down to it um, and I think that's what it, it's it's a weird time and like you said uh, this is nothing I don't think I mean I, I talked to my grandmother and she's 80 84 years old it, it's it's nothing like anybody's ever seen sure. so like including her so it, it's Nobody was ready for it. Um, it's just how you pivot. It's, it's how you pivot the situation and, and do the best you can for the most part. Um, yeah. yeah. So, so as you know, I'm, I'm quite the optimist. Mm -hmm. And 2020 has been a pretty rough year for, has. for the, the, the whole world, really. Yeah. So looking at it from an optimistic perspective, how has COVID benefit the golf course because you know this this whole the whole world right now there's been a lot of terrible things that have happened but what i what i like to see is that people are joining together and then trying to make a world a better place mm -hmm. because of the terrible things that happen mm -hmm. so for covid just a small small example here at center golf club how did covid benefit center so at least from for me from from uh from my standpoint what I've seen is there's the first thing that the first thing that opened or the last thing that closed was golf courses. So and then the first thing that opened was golf courses. So we were fortunate that we were able to open in the time that we did. Um, and what I've seen personally is I've seen a lot of people that have never played the game. Yep. Um, a lot of people that I, you know, I went to school with, they're, they're hitting up my cell phone like, hey, you know, I'm getting into the game of golf. I want to learn. You know, I need lessons. Uh, you know, what kind of club should I get? So, and people have people have a little bit of money right now, and especially for the people that have, that are continuously uh, 
that didn't have a layoff or, or furlough, um, they're getting into the game. So now you have new golfers. Yeah. So if half of, if those new golfers stay in the game, then you know I think the golf industry it could be in a good place right now. Um, but I mean we'll we'll see. But I, I think, you know, on that, on that front, I would say the most important thing was the intro, introductory uh, process to the game yeah. from from the new golfer. That it's, it's hard to get new golfers. It's hard to attract new golfers um, because it's the quote-unquote old man sport. And there's a lot of younger kids that's, that, that have, uh, you know, started picking up clubs. A lot, a lot of people that we see on the weekend. Yeah. Uh, and I think the generic answer to that question would be that you've got a month to fix up the golf course as good as yeah. it can be. And that's what a lot of customers come in when they say, like, oh, you guys had all this time to fix the golf course. But on the contrary, mm-hmm. we're not bringing money. Mm-hmm. So how much can you really fix? Mm-hmm. But people don't look at it from the perspective of this is opening up the game to all different people Correct. that just want to get out of the house and do something. Yep. So, if you know... If half of the new people stay, mm-hmm. then COVID definitely. Bad. Like we will take that month off, ten times out of ten, to get fifty percent more customers. That sure, of course. Um. So now onto the the lower side, though. Mm-hmm. When we talk about the benefits, we should all talk about the downfalls. What truly impacted the golf course downfall wise, and then personally. How were you affected by COVID? So um, the the golf course side, obviously not not having any revenue coming in, yeah, that that hurt for a month. Um, but I would say that for for me personally, I know a couple of people that had the virus, and it from their experience, it is not fun. I mean, people are walking around with masks. Uh, It's just a different world we live in. And I think that's not going to change for for at least a year. Um, I mean, is the vaccine going to be the end-all, be-all? I don't think so. I mean, I think a lot of people are going to be uh, leery on, you know, going out in public, outings. I don't don't know. I mean, there's a lot of unknowns right now um, on the future of uh people's health i mean if, and like i said for me the people that did contract the virus i mean they they tell tell me that you, you don't want that like it's 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 no joke and obviously you know it's sad that so many people have died you know this is this is unprecedented this is this is crazy um it's a crazy time i mean that i think it's uh there's a lot of smart people in this country, and I think that, you know, with the doctors and the, the, the first responders, I mean, I think they, they did a, they're doing a great job, um, but it's, it's, it's a sad time. It's a sad time. Yeah, I think that a lot of people are right on the brink. They're like, okay, I need to go do something. Yes. I need to get out. And honestly, like, when we talk about the protests that are going on right now, I think that what adds to it is the fact that the government has kept us in for so long. Sure. So it just adds to the tension of people. With the with the protests going on, how, how do you when, when you look at that, especially from somebody who's an African American mm-hmm. in a majority white sport, mm-hmm. how, how do you see this whole thing playing out? Um, so from, from an African American, when I, when I got into the business, uh, I knew, and I was not, you know, I, I guess I was, I was naive to, uh, you know, the rest of the world. Um, growing up in the town I lived in, I, I, me and you had this conversation the other day. Um, I don't think there was any racism in my town. i I'm pretty, to say that is naive, you know, at at a young age. So when I got into the business, I thought, oh, there's nothing, you know, I'm a black guy, you know, I'm just going to 
you know, I'm going to do this. Um, I guess it was pretty early in my uh, professional career that I started to see, like, hey, you know, why is that guy looking at me? Kind of funny. Like, like, what am I supposed to be? What am I doing here? You know, like, oh, I'm the golf professional, and they're like, and they give me that look, yeah. and it's like, like I can't be here. Like, so that was the first time where, like, and it's it, it's really a shame because a lot of people think it doesn't exist. Yeah, and that's the problem. That that is that is partially part of the problem. It does exist. Um, and it's it, it's alive and it's healthy, um, oh, and sure. I think with the with the protest, uh, you know, being an African American, I think you know, police brutality enough's enough. I remember um, when I was a kid, when I was seventeen, eighteen, when I first started, you know, driving, um, I was taught how to deal with the police. Yeah. Um, Something that something that me being Caucasian, I don't really have to even think twice about that. Right, right. If you get pulled over, I think there's prejudice there. Um, if I get pulled over and you know fidgeting in my car, you know that could be a red flag just because of based on the color of my skin. If you do the same thing, it might not. Yeah. So uh, that's it's unfair, and I think that. I think that now it's opening a lot of people's eyes. I, I agree. And I think it's not even just what, what I'm so appreciative about the protest is that I, I don't think this is just opening the eyes for people to see the problems with police brutality, mm -hmm. but also the problems with just racism in our country as a whole. Sure. And I think that is what is really so important about protesting, about supporting, about donating, mm -hmm. is that it opens up the eyes of Thousands, hundreds of thousands of people in this country, millions of people in this country, yeah. that they didn't see their bias. Sure. They didn't see, oh, why if the if the guy just if the guy just complied with the police, this wouldn't have happened. No, it happens constantly. Yeah. And it's not just with the police. Mm -hmm. You now see people. Oh, wh why aren't you sporting? Oh, all lives matter. Mm -hmm. Like that that prejudice is starting to end. Because yeah. eyes are being opened because of the protests. Yeah, and the the all the people that say all lives matter, uh, they're pretty much saying that black lives don't matter. Yeah, in a way. Yeah, and those people are part of the problem. Now, mm -hmm. now, <clears throat> there's people out there. Uh, people are going to be out there. Yeah, uh, that just they hate other people that don't look like them. Simple as that. Never met them. Never had a conversation with them. It's just that's the way. Of the, that's just the way of life. I mean, yeah. that's that, that's how their dad taught them. That's how their mother taught them. That's how their grandparents taught them. It and it's just it, an unconscious bias. Correct. They don't even realize that they're doing it. And and it's it's sad, but it's it's going to continue. Now, if we can do better as far as the the police brutality, and you know, with with uh, Colin Kaepernick taking a knee. Um, I think a lot of people misread, and it, it it starts with the people up top. Um, a lot of people misread his meaning yeah. behind that because it this has been going on for years. For years. It hasn't just. Been I mean, me personally, I I was definitely one of those people that was like, oh, he's doing it the wrong way. Mm -hmm. Oh, why why does he have to take a knee? Why does he have to wear the socks mm -hmm. with the pigs as police officers? Mm -hmm. But then something like this happens again mm -hmm. and you realize like uh, like if there's any way to do it he did it the right way he used his platform yep. to to show like in a peaceful way. in a peaceful way right. and i i've been saying this since the protest started protesting to me is one of the most american things that you can do when people are like oh they're against america if they're protesting no america was built on protesting correct we literally the whole the whole country would start from a revolutionary war. It's not – we didn't just like right. snap our fingers and become America. Right. We went through a lot of trials and tribulations to get to where we are today. Okay. And this hopefully is just one stepping stone to make America mm -hmm. the best. So – and I'm going to ask you a question. Right? Go ahead. 
So, and I don't, I don't know if, if this is going to make the podcast. Hopefully it does. But I want to ask you a question. So what is the difference between the peaceful, peaceful protests in Washington, D.C. and the quote-unquote peaceful pro- protests in Michigan when there were people with assault rifles on Capitol Hill trying to open up the country? What's the difference? I see a difference. I see a difference. So, so, so and, but, but here's the thing. So we have looters, rioters, right? Now, is that is that happening? Yes. Is it They're, good? Is it good? Absolutely no. not. But the people that are actually trying to get their point across are the peaceful people, the people that want destruction and want to create mayhem. Those people are looting and rioting. All different skin cover, colors, by the way. Yeah. All different skin yeah. colors. Yeah. So. The, the protest now is put up on this, this it, it, it's getting negative light because, oh, they're rioting, they're burning things. They're really, the, 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 black, the black people, the Black Lives Matter movement, they are not doing that. Now, what's the difference between them and in, in Michigan? I don't, I, it, I, I know what the difference is. Yeah. But. And you see, and that's, that all goes back to what the problem is. Correct. Because if, let's just say the protesters, in, in, any, in any of the many cities that the protests have been, mm-hmm. if African Americans were carrying assault rifles like that, oh, it, it, would have been, it would be a war. It would be a war. I mean, like, it, the, it's, army, it's, the, army, the, the army. It's legitimately would be. simple as that, though. Correct. Because African Americans are being killed unarmed. Correct. So if they had assault rifles, I couldn't. I couldn't imagine no. what what would what would come of that. Correct. So and then just add, add on to because you're you're one of not many African Americans that are GMs of golf courses, not only in South Jersey but in America altogether. Sure. Can you continue on what it's like to be in your shoes? Every day. Uh, I mean, so going from being the front guy, I would say, as a head professional, you're you're the guy out front. You're the guy dealing with people on yeah. a daily basis. Uh, my role now is is not as much out front dealing with people on a daily basis. I'm more behind the scenes, um, you know, uh, dealing with the other things how to keep this business running. Um, so as far as that goes, the, the hardest, the, I guess the hardest thing was, uh, becoming a, a head professional being out front, and yeah. even, even as an assistant for years, um, uh, being out front, because if somebody has a problem, they're, they're, they're coming to me. Yeah. Um, now, you know, there's a chain of command, uh, in the, in the system where, you know, if I'm dealing with the person. If there's a problem, I'm dealing with them very less. Yeah. It has to be something, you know, Extreme. major for me to deal with. Yeah. Um, so right now, I would say it's still, I mean, it, it it's still a challenge, I guess. Um, because when, like I said, when you, when you tell, when you tell somebody not, that doesn't look like you, yeah, I'm a, I'm a GM of a golf course. They kind of look at you funny. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're what? Yeah, a golf course. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you get that a lot. I mean, but but besides that, I mean, come to work, do my job. You know, everything's pretty much. We have, we have we do have good people. I think we do have good people that come here. Uh, we had good people at at White Oaks, and we definitely had good people at Freeway. Yeah. Um. So. And for the listeners that don't know, because mm-hmm. I, for me, I never even heard about Freeway until I met you. Mm-hmm. Can you tell a little bit? Because I, I, after I learned about Freeway, I think the history is outstanding. Mm-hmm. Tell the listeners a little bit about what what Freeway means to you mm-hmm. and what Freeway, like the history behind Freeway. Mm-hmm. So uh, Freeway was the first uh, African American owned and operated golf course in the country. Um, like Paul's, that's, yeah, that's, that's great. It was in our backyard. Yeah. 
it's amazing to say that. True. And then you being the last. Coming coming from coming from freeway, I learned a lot about the history of, of African Americans and golf in general. Um, same thing like with the history of African Americans in this country. It was the same thing. Yeah. I've heard stories where uh, I think it was Lee Elder when he was on tour. Um, they when he would have practice rounds, um, they would poop, like literally take a, a shit in the cup and make him reach his ball out and get it. Like that that is just like straight, you know, just bottom of the barrel. Like yeah. low, very extremely low. And the stories that I hear uh, some of these guys had to go through just to compete. You know, it's like just to play a sport. Just to play a sport. Can you imagine if LeBron James, just to play basketball, had to go over loops and bound? Like, it, yeah. it's it's crazy yeah. what they had to deal with. So I learned a lot about the history of, of the black golfer. Everybody thinks about Tiger Woods, you know. Like, his his road was, was pretty easy, right? I'm sure he dealt with, you know, a lot of things that I explained earlier in this podcast. But Tiger uh, – Tiger's one of one, right? One yeah. of very few. Uh, now it's it's good. You got at least you, uh, Cam Champ. You got Harold Varner Harold, third. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, but there's not enough. You know, yeah. there's not enough. And free freeway, it was it wasn't predominantly black. Like a lot of people had in their mind that just like only African Americans played there. It was like it was just an African American club. It wasn't. Yeah. A lot of the workers were. I mean, like myself, a lot of the workers were. Um, but I, w- I would say as far as, like, daily fee players and members, it was probably 60% Caucasian to yeah. 40% black or 30% black. And you know, we had a few Asian customers. Um, it, was a, it was a melting pot. That's what it was. And it, every everybody everybody felt like they were welcome there. Um where if, if if you went other places as an African American, you might not feel welcome. Yeah, um, and that's a shame. I mean, that, and that was in two thousand nine, two thousand ten, when I first started playing, uh, traveling with the the groups. I ran the uh, the men's league for a while. We had thirty to forty guys, and we used to travel to to different golf courses. And freeway was always home because we were treated the best. Yeah, you know. Right. Um, we go to other places and we had, you know, weird looks, weird yeah. looks. And then occasionally the ranger would be like, all right, pick it up, pick it up. And it's like, we're, we're on a two hour pace. Like, yeah. You know, for, for nine. So we, we dealt with that. Um, great people there too. Uh, like life lessons are just not. Exactly. Freeway. So, <laughs> so somebody asked me, they said, you know, describe freeway in a sh- Many words as you can, just short, short and sweet. I said, okay. I said, barbershop. So if you ever watch the movie Barbershop, right? <clears throat> um, who's, who's in that movie? You got uh, Cedric the Entertainer. He's in, he's in the movie. He's the guy that sits in the corner, right, in the barbershop. And he's telling all the stories, you know. That's what Freeway was, yeah. like in a nutshell. Like as a kid, uh, 18, 19 years old. I'm listening. I'm taking everything in from these old guys, you know, whether it's golf, whether it's about uh, sports, whether it's about life, just like in general, yeah. just taking in all this information. That's why, you know, people say that I have, you know, I'm, I'm older than my age, you know, at, at 29 to be in this position, like I never would have expected. I never would have expected I would have been in golf at 17, yeah. but from taking all that information from uh, just to rifle off a couple of names, and you know these guys, Bill Wood, Ron Raymond, um, George, Bridges. George, George Bridges, George Butler, you know, just listening to them talk and talk about life and the game, that's how my mind thinks like a 60-year-old, yeah. not a 29-year-old. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, so, yeah, it was, it was it was a great place. Sad, sad that it... You know, it had to close down, but a um, lot of lot of long term, you know, life lessons that I learned yeah. from that place. So we got to wrap it up soon, <clears throat> considering we should have customers coming in any minute. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but in conclusion, mm-hmm. what do you hope to see in the future, not only for Senderson, mm-hmm. not only for Empire, and not only for the game of golf, but just like how the world is right now? 2021, what do you hope to say? Uh, well, to go to go into what we what we talked about before uh, and police brutality, I would I would like to see because there's a lot of there's a lot of bad cops out there. There's yeah. a lot of great ones too, uh, and I'm friendly with a couple. Um, there's a lot of cops that really mean well and really you know they they protect and serve. I want to see some type of police reform. I do. Um, I think that needs to happen on a on a f- on a s- federal scale. Yeah. Um, yeah, it has to be a, a mandate from the top um, in order to, to create change. And I think I think we're close. I, I really do. As far away as some people might think, I think we are close. So that that's one thing moving forward um, for for the golf course in general. Um, every year, each and every month, every hour, we're getting better. We're competing. Um, the golf course when we first got here uh, was not very good, to, to say the least. Um, to see it uh, a little over a full calendar year, to see it, I, I would have never expected in a year. I would have expected maybe in three. Yeah. Uh, but not this soon. So the golf course constantly growing, uh, constantly we're constantly getting better operation side inside outside we're getting better every day um and then you know the the ultimate goal is like we didn't we didn't just start this company to have one golf like manage one golf facility the the goal was to manage multiple yeah we want to keep growing um where you, if you think big you get big yeah. if you think small you get small so national is that possible maybe I don't know. We'll see, but at least we branch. You got to start somewhere. You got to start somewhere. Yeah. And Centerton was that. This was the first. So, yeah. and then we're we're gonna keep growing every year. We're gonna keep competing. That's what yeah. that's what we're gonna do. Yeah. All right. Well, I think this I think this went pretty well. Um, thanks for thanks for telling us all the great stuff that you you had to tell us. Anytime. Okay. So ho- hopefully we can do this again. Sometime soon. Thank you.